This is Joe this Anderson, is Joe. who is very well known uh, because of his, I think your first good paper was a genome paper for how to find a, a valid uh, a, a, a mRNA uh, for normalization, and I, I think this was about mid of mid of mid of 2000, and, and I also invited you here to give your talk here. And since this day, we are ah, scientific friends, and tell me like this. So I don't want to tell a long story short. Um, he will talk about also extracellular RNA profiling in human biofluids, and the floor is yours, Joe. Thank you, Michael. Indeed, we are friends scientifically and personally, and always enjoy coming to Weinstefan. So I hope the March next year will be the same. So thanks for inviting me, giving me a talk. Um, indeed, about extracellular RNA in liquid biopsies, but doing it a little bit different than what most others are used to do. So it's clear that liquid biopsies are emerging as the cornerstone of precision medicine their minimally invasive nature, their ability to do serial profiling of the same patient, and their lower susceptibility of sampling bias because of tissue heterogeneity are definitely key attributes for its success. Um, and just before the COVID-19 pandemic struck, I did a literature survey of which the results you see here um, of the liquid biopsy space. And the, the field is clearly dominated by DNA applications with 52% of the articles studying DNA in a liquid biopsy of which 5%, that's a dark green uh, part, uh, studying specifically DNA methylation. And it's clear if you look at the, the, the entire right side of the slide in, in pink, uh, that RNA is clearly lagging uh, behind. Um, only a few, 16% of the studies in liquid biopsy study RNA, and the majority of which the light pink is then uh, microRNA. So hardly any messenger RNA studies in liquid biopsies. And there are several reasons for this observed lack of enthusiasm for the analysis of messenger RNA and other RNAs in liquid biopsies. Uh, one, there is this incorrect belief that RNA is completely degraded and cannot be measured. Of note, cell-free DNA is also degraded or fragmented, multiples of 160 nucleotides in, in for instance, blood plasma with short half-lives of only a few hours. So RNA is not too different. Secondly, uh, the perceived lack of methods for true, precise, and sensitive measurements of fragmented RNA. Three, the much larger dynamic range of RNA abundance, typically four to five orders of magnitude. And this really makes it very different and more complicated than DNA-based work in a liquid biopsy. So it's, it's rather technically challenging to study messenger RNA in a, a liquid biopsy. So, most of us will consider blood-derived biofluids like plasma and serum as suitable substrates for liquid biopsy analysis. But I just want to indicate with this particular slide here that there are more than 20 different human biofluids uh, that exist. And they all contain cell-free messenger RNA in varying degrees. And they may be more informative for particular uh, diseases. So in a joint effort between Ghent University and Illumina, we have created this so-called human biofluid RNA atlas. That was our attempt to deeply probe into the extracellular RNA transcriptome of 20 different human biofluids. The study was published end of last year in Cell Reports, and it's, according to our information, the most comprehensive study in which messenger RNA, microRNA, and circular RNAs were studied. And we also investigated exogenous RNA from bacteria and viruses. But today, I will only focus on the messenger RNA and to some extent also the circular RNA parts. But please have a look at the paper and then you can find much more details than I will present today. A key question is where does all the RNA come from in the extracellular space? Well, all human cells and tissues actively and passively release RNA under the form of as discussed by Michael, uh, extracellular vesicles, so like exosomes, microvesicles, apoptotic bodies, what have you all, but also RNA bound to RNA binding proteins and ribonucleoprotein complexes, such as AGO2 and high density lipoproteins. But RNA may also be contained in platelets and other particles. And ultimately, RNA may indeed be present as a naked molecule, most likely only circular RNAs because they are protected from 
uh, exonucleotic uh, degradation because they don't have any free um, ends of the RNA molecule. So today it is not very well understood uh, how much and which RNA is intact or fragmented in circulation in liquid biopsies, but it's clear that some molecules are protected. And as such, RNA has, amongst others, been documented uh, has to have a role in intercellular communication as a so-called new class of hormones. But whatever its function, it can effectively be exploited as a biomarker, both in terms of abundance differences, so a little bit more, a little bit less RNA, but also in terms of structural alterations, such as alternative splicing, fusion genes, and single nucleotide variants. If we look at the size distribution of purified extracellular RNA fragments uh, from human blood plasma, it is clear that the majority are really of short fragments with a, a modal peak size of about 91 uh, nucleotides. Here you see the femtopulse electrophorogram of RNA purified from platelet-rich plasma from a healthy donor using the mentioned RNA extraction purification kit. Of note, uh, here you see probably the likely presence of intact ribosomal RNA, these small peaks at around three to 4,000 uh, kilo bases, but the majority is definitely highly fragmented. And I'm often asked at this stage, so uh, what is the stability of extracellular RNA in biofluids? But there are different uh, angles to this particular question. First of all, there's the in vivo half-life of the extracellular space. Secondly, in the collection tube, the RNA may have different half-lives in the stored biofluid and once purified, so as purified RNA. And for the latter, we know that RNA can be extremely stable if properly treated, for instance, RNA's free conditions and at cold temperatures such as minus 80 degrees. And when stored as a biofluid, it is recommended to avoid repeated free thaw cycles. In the tube itself, after collection, I will show you some data at the end of my talk that indeed uh, the, the conditions of storage prior to storing the fluid uh, may have significant impacts on the overall transcriptome profiles. And finally, the in vivo stability of extracellular RNA is really uncharted terrain. At Ghent University, we're currently initiating studies to measure these in vivo half-lives uh, using uh, an optimized and modified slant seek uh, technology. To handle the um, small amounts of fragmented extracellular RNA, um, one needs really sophisticated methods. At Bioxeller at Ghent University, we have developed methods to handle all these classes of RNA. Bioxeller is a CRO providing services to the biotech and the pharmaceutical industry in a quality environment, but the, pub, uh, the papers are out there uh, enabling others to, to adopt these uh, technologies. Uh, on the one hand, we have library prep methods for small RNAs, which is more historically controlled and a little bit easier to do. And on the other hand, we have dedicated methods to sequence either all long RNAs using so-called total RNA sequencing or the three prime end of polyadenylated genes or a hybrid probe capture-based targeted sequencing of all messenger RNAs or long long coding RNAs. As mentioned today, I will focus on the messenger RNA sequencing part only, but please note there are different methods depending on your RNA biotype of interest. We have established two methods for messenger RNA sequencing of human biofluids depicted here. On the left part of the slide, we have a modified Illuminous RNA exome method, whereby we use hybrid capture probes to target all human exons. The method was published in a STARS protocol paper um, earlier this year. And on the right side, we have a modified Takara Bio a Smarter total RNA sequencing approach where unwanted ribosomal RNA is removed in the library using a so called zapper probes, which are CRISPR based and cleave the ribosomal RNA CDNA fragments prior to further amplification and sequencing. And that was published in uh, scientific reports and nucleic acid research two years ago. So we typically do paired end sequencing, about 15 to 20 million, gives you a really rich library of the extracellular. RNA transcriptome. Importantly, the total RNA seq method also measures intronic fragments, so we can uh, exploit the ratio exonic versus intronic reads to come to some kind of uh, post transcriptional regulation analysis, which is unique of that particular uh, method. 
Importantly, when introducing a new method in the lab, one needs to assess its performance. We never accept uh, what is published or what the supplier is telling us. So we do significant analysis to understand the limitations and the power of the methods. So while there are numerous metrics, including ease of use, scalability, cost, etc., we truly believe that precision, analytical sensitivity, quantitative accuracy uh, are, are paramount performance metrics. So you want a method that is robust and reproducible. You want the detection of a high number of genes. It is the high analytical sensitivity and excellent quantitative accuracy. We typically assess this by assessing the trueness or the correspondence between expected and observed fault changes. And finally, um, we um, make sure that the, the method is fit for purpose using the biomaterials that we get typically from uh, the clinic. Our methods are characterized by excellent repeatability as shown here. You see an example of total RNA sequencing of RNA purification replicates of platelet-free plasma from an EDTA blood collection tubes. And please note, this is the total workflow variation, including RNA extraction, lab preparation, sequencing, data processing, and analysis. So the green dots are the genes that are reproducibly de detected above a certain uh, cutoff. We typically uh, use four reads per gene as reproducible detection, and the blue uh, genes are genes that uh, are below that detection cutoff in one of the two uh, replicates. And this is typically how we select and filter uh, reproducible data. Uh, this way of um, removing noisy genes was published originally in our Nature Methods paper from 2014 in the microRNA quality control study. Okay, because of the challenging nature of biofluids, low input, degraded RNA or fragmented RNA and varying RNA content, um, and because of processing induced variability of um, RNA purification and library preparation, the use of spike in RNA controls is really crucial. So we constantly add a set of 78 complexly spliced sequin RNA spikes to the lysate and a set of well-known 92 uh, ERCC uh, simple non-spliced uh, RNA controls. And this combination of uh, spike in control sets uh, over a wide dynamic range of input enables us to measure RNA purification efficiency and to determine the relative or the absolute concentration of RNA in the biofluid per volume of biofluid. Of note, the fraction of reads mapping to spikes scales inversely, uh, as they pointed here, uh, to the endogenous RNA content. And we believe that normalization against spikes added to the lysates is really one of the most meaningful ways to uh, measure RNA concentration per volume of biofluid. And by assessing the ratio of sequin over ERCC, we can truly determine the RNA extraction uh, efficiency. So there's definitely a lot of value in using these RNA spiking controls. We can also use these spiking controls to create artificial contrived samples with built-in truth to assess this so-called quantitative accuracy. So we added different spiking mixes in varying amounts in a background of human plasma RNA from a healthy donor. And they were diluted in opposite order, uh, like this cross as depicted here on the slide, uh, resulting in biologically relevant fourfold dynamic range. So that's really a small range, but we purposely selected that narrow range to determine the method's ability to detect small abundance differences, which you typically encounter in human biofluids. This is unlikely tissues where you have fold difference of 10 or 100 times more. This is not so much in liquid biopsy. So you really want to know how quantitative your method is in these small expression differences. Uh, of note, both the sequin and the ERCC spike-in mixtures contain uh, multiple RNA molecules present in varying concentration. As you so see here on the right in this colored violin plot, there is a strong correlation between the expected and the observed fold changes. It's not perfect, but you have all kinds of biases RT, PCR, and sequencing, which ultimately result in this, uh, uh, I would say, okay correlation between expected and observed fall changes within this short or uh, limited dynamic range. Um, so when we apply our optimized methods on the 20 human biofluids, each time with two replicates uh, from this human biofluid RNA atlas project, we see the following uh, picture emerging. 
Uh, on the y-axis, you see the messenger RNA concentration per milliliter of biofluid volume. And there is a striking difference of about a 10,000 10, fold difference in messenger RNA concentration among the biofluids. Aqueous humor in pink, CSF and sweat have the lowest RNA concentration in contrast to breast milk, seminal fluid and tears that are among the highest, around 20 nanograms of messenger RNA per ml. Of note, in the small inset on the right side, you see that the messenger RNA and the microRNA concentrations largely agree, show the same trend across the different human uh, biofluids. Um, importantly, the likelihood to identify an RNA biomarker in a given biofluid will not only depend on its own RNA concentration, but also on the RNA diversity here approximated by the fraction of read counts consumed by the top 10 most abundant mRNAs. And this is because RNA sequencing is a co compositional uh, method. So um, the number of reads that go to your gene of interest is really determined on the complexity of your sample. As you see here in aqueous humor, the top 10 messenger RNAs represent about 70% of all reads, indicating that this fluid does not contain a rich repertoire. And although amniotic fluid has a median RNA concentration, this fluid seems to contain really a diverse set of messenger RNAs with only 7% of all the reads going to the top 10 messenger RNAs. And in one of the most studied biofluids, blood-derived double-spun platelet-free plasma uh, in the middle, PFP, uh, 20 to 25% of all the reads go to the top uh, 10 genes. So it has an intermediate RNA complexity. RNA diversity is also reflected in the table on the right side, where I depict the number of detected messenger RNAs. And this total number of messenger RNAs detected with at least four counts in both samples range from about 13,000 in pancreatic cyst fluid to around a couple of hundred in aqueous humor. Of note, don't take these values as gold standards or cut in stone because this number really depends on the biofluid input volume, the RNA extraction method, the amount of RNA you carry over to your RNA library prep, your RNA library prep method, your sequencing depth, your data processing, etc. But it gives you a relative feeling of the diversity and the range of the numbers you may expect depending on the biofluid uh, of interest. Another striking observation in the RNA biofluid RNA atlas was the strong enrichment of circular RNA in all biofluids. Circular RNA is a relatively novel class of RNA originating from backsplicing of otherwise linear transcripts. And as circular RNAs do not contain free 5' prime or 3' prime ends, as already mentioned earlier, they are somewhat resistant towards exonucleases. And as such, they may be very well present as naked molecules in the biofluids. Here we show that the circular to linear ratio depicted on the y-axis are significantly higher in biofluids. These are the red uh, box plots compared to tissues in blue. In some fluids, for instance, in blood plasma, almost uh, entirely on the left, more than half of the genes have uh, at least one RNA, uh, more, excuse me, more than half of the genes with at least one circular RNA transcript have more circular transcripts than linear transcripts in these particular biofluids. So there is a clear enrichment of circular RNAs in these biofluids. Gaining insights in tissue contribution to biofluid RNA profiles may guide the selection of the most appropriate biofluid to investigate a given disease. And to define tissues that specifically contribute to RNA molecules to individual biofluids, we explored the relationship between extracellular messenger RNA levels and tissue or cell type specific messenger RNA signatures. It's a rather complicated analysis, but the heat map shown here highlights that some uh, tissues relatively contribute more to some biofluids than others. For instance, prostate tissue RNA biomarkers are more abundant as expected in urine and seminal plasma. Uh, sputum and saliva contain more messenger RNA specific for trachea and esophagus. And these results strongly suggest that biofluid uh, messenger RNA levels reflect intracellular messenger RNA levels from the cells that produce or transport these uh, biofluids. And finally, to investigate more uh, into a to the origin of the extracellular RNA 
at the single cell level, we applied computational deconvolution of the two pancreatic cyst fluid samples that were part of the human uh, biofluid atlas. And I'm sorry, I'll make this bigger. Um, and we compared the contribution of 10 different pancreatic cell types. And the figure on the right reveals that the pancreatic cyst fluid one mainly consists of RNA from activated stellate cells, while pancreatic cyst fluid uh, number two on the right mainly consists of quiescent stellate cells and acinar cells. And this may have some uh, medical uh, relevance, according to the experts, which I'm not. So while blood plasma is clearly the most popular liquid biopsy to date, it may not always be the most relevant one to study a particular disease. Here you see pilot data from one study um, to, um, in which we um, compared matched urine and plasma from 24 high risk uh, or de novo metastatic uh, uh, prostate, excuse me, prostate cancer patients and controls. And it's very clear that all prostate tissue and prostate cancer specific RNA genes are much more abundant as depicted by the reddish color in the urine compared to plasma. So it may just be much more appropriate to study urine uh, in the context of um, prostate cancer. And to evaluate uh, if there is any biomarker potential in uh, different biofluids that we studied, we have looked at three particular uh, case control cohorts. Um, on the left, we profiled sputum in patients uh, with uh, a COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease versus controls in the middle urine from bladder cancer patients versus controls and on the right, cerebrospinal fluid or CSF from glioblastoma cancer patients versus uh, controls. And in each of these three cohorts, we could identify relevant RNA biomarkers, some of which uh, are linked to the etiology of the disease or are known biomarkers. As an example, perhaps difficult to see, I'm pointing with my mouse in sputum, CCL20 showed a exceptionally 146-fold abundance difference in COPD patients compared to healthy controls. This potent chemokine attracts dendritic cells and has previously been linked to the pathogenesis of COPD. This huge fold change is really exceptional, but it's a clear example of the potential of using RNAs and biofluids as uh, biomarkers. So uh, by now, I hope I've convinced you that other biofluids uh, can be, uh, um, other biofluids than blood plasma, I mean, can be uh, important and valuable for, for studying human diseases. However, it's clear that plasma is really uh, dominating the field. And unfortunately, the pre-analytical steps in these studies widely differ. In our laboratory, we did some preliminary testing and immediately noticed large differences uh, when we subtly changed one of these pre-analytical uh, variables. So we therefore randomly selected 100 published articles from 2017 and 18 and assessed how well the authors described presumed important pre-analytical variables, such as the blood collection tube, the plasma preparation protocol, etc. The conclusions were uh, disappointing in that less than 10% report variables that are important to understand and replicate uh, the study. So clearly much work is to be done. And this prompted us to initiate a very large collaborative study among Ghent University by Xal and Illumina, coined the Extracellular RNA Quality Control Study. Uh, it consists of three phases. The first phase is successfully completed after more than three years and almost 30 researchers. The second phase is ongoing and will end the first quarter of next year. And then phase three is for later next year. In the first phase, we mainly assessed the single variables on the outcome of uh, xRNA sequencing results, such as the blood collection tube, the RNA purification method. And in phase two, we have really zoomed in on the most promising uh, blood collection tubes and RNA purification kits to study interactions among these. Um, and in phase three, we'll focus more on fully nested designs to understand at which level, what amount of variability is introduced in an xRNA uh, sequencing workflow in order to design better clinical uh, studies. Before I, I finish, I just want to give you some of the results of this extracellular RNA quality control study. Um, so in phase one, and that's published as a preprint, it's available as of May uh, this year, uh, we evaluated 10 blood collection tubes, three time points between blood draw and plasma processing, 
we compared eight different RNA purification methods using the supplier supplied um, maximum and minimal input um, volumes. And the impact of these pre analytics was assessed by very deep transcriptome profiling of both small, mainly microRNA, and a long, mainly messenger RNA and circular RNA sequencing. Using the 189 spike in control that I mentioned previously to really control all kinds of workflow issues and better understand and document differences among workflows. So in total, more than 5 billion reads were generated and 11 performance metrics were calculated. Um, I don't have the time today to discuss all the results. I will just uh, do some, some selections, but please have a look at our preprint that is available on BioArchive. Um, here you see the snapshot of results of the RNA purification kits. Um, 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 one kit was immediately dismissed because we had issues with DNA treatment, so that then kept us uh, only a limited number of kits uh, to, to document and to, to analyze. Ultimately, we ended up with 13 different conditions ranging from 100 microliter up to 5 milliliter of plasma input, so that's a 50-fold range in input, and an elution volume of 14 to 100 microliter. Uh, of note, one particular kit did not concentrate the sample as the input was 100 microliter and the aluid was also 100 microliter. So it's some kind of uh, buffer exchange purification, obviously significantly impacting uh, the sensitivity of that uh, particular uh, method. But we observed striking performance differences among the test kits. Here you see the number of detected genes uh, with at least four counts using 24 million read pairs as input for, for the data analysis. And based on the spike-in RNA evaluation uh, explained earlier, we observed a 76-fold difference in messenger RNA concentration and a 30-fold difference in mRNA yield. So the variance in yield is obviously lower as the differences in the elevate volume are canceled out by doing calculations. In line with these observations, uh, there is a net 11-fold difference in the number of detected genes, ranging from around 1,000 genes in the worst kit up to 11,000 genes uh, for the best performing kit as depicted here in this particular slide. In addition to concentration, uh, yield and gene detection count, we also evaluated other performance metrics as depicted here in this heat map, uh, such as extraction efficiency was uh, determined based on assessing the ratio of the spikes added prior and after extraction. And this differed more than tenfold, which is huge. Um, the sequencing reduplication levels are also known to be high for biofluids and they range from 82% uh, for the best kit to 97% for the worst kit. So more PCR duplicates than actual true unique data. So while these differences may seem small, they really result in a six-fold uh, difference in more unique and non-duplicated reads for the best performing workflow extraction kit than the other. So other metrics that we calculated, I will not go into much detail, are precision, data retention, and transcriptome coverage. So all metrics were converted into robust Z-scores, and um, then we did some clustering to uh, cluster kits according to performance and uh, uh, depicted here. So our recommendation to uh, suppliers is definitely to work on higher input volumes and lower elute volumes to maximize sensitivity. That's definitely a, a great learning from this uh, particular uh, study. As indicated before, in phase two, we wanted to continue with the best two extraction kits for messenger RNA and microRNA uh, separately. And we believe that precision and sensitivity matters most if you really have to single out two performance metrics that are most important. So we, we select the best kits in terms of these two performance metrics. And you see the results summarized here for messenger RNA on the left and microRNA is on the right. And please note that the huge performance differences across these two metrics for both messenger RNA and microRNA spread over four Z-score units in performance. That's huge. So based on this performance and input volume, we finally selected the CCF DNA RNA kit for mRNA and the microRNA the serum plasma from Kaijan uh, as kits for messenger RNA, and then the uh, Maxwell kit with 500 microliters of input and the microRNA serum plasma advanced uh, for microRNAs as the four best kits each two times best performance for messenger RNA and microRNA, uh, respectively. And to finish off my talk, if I still have a few minutes, uh, that was the evaluation of the blood collection tubes. I can be rather quick, but results are nevertheless very 
astonishing. So we used three donors, three different time points, 10 different tubes, looked both at small RNA and messenger RNA. And um, half of these tubes are so-called preservation tubes. So you can keep the tube for a few hours, if not days on the bench, and supposedly uh, do not worry about alterations in transcriptomes. Not true. And uh, the other tubes are more classic non-preservation tubes, which as I will show you, actually perform better than these so-called newer preservation tubes. Um, in contrast to popular opinion, the serum tube performed quite well. Here you see the biotep distribution for long RNA on the left and small RNA on the right. EDTA, plasma and serum are very similar when considering long RNA across the three donors and the time points, but in contrast, Serum and IDTA, EDTA plasma are very different when it comes to small RNAs. When you suddenly see tRNA fragments in yellow and pbRNAs in orange popping up in serum. Also, the yRNA fraction in serum much more pronounced. So it really depends on the RNA biotype, which blood collection tube may be appropriate for your study. When we looked at um, uh, other aspects such as hemolysis which is definitely a confounding variable that red blood cells are actually lysed uh, and carry over rna uh, into your liquid biopsy um, we, we, we definitely assessed um, hemolysis based on spectral photometric analysis at uh, 414 uh, nanometers absorption um, all the non-preservation tubes had absorbance levels below 0.2 which is considered a cutoff of non-hemolytic, but in contrast, the so-called preservation tubes all had signs of hemolysis for at least one donor and one time point. And on the right, you see one time point, type of zero for donor five with clear signs of hemolysis for Roche, RNA streck and Pax gene uh, tubes, which is clearly uh, problematic. The ratio of the reads mapping to extracellular messenger RNA and the spike in RNAs added during RNA extraction is a measure of the relative RNA concentration in the biofluid, as mentioned before. On top, you clearly see high and stable messenger RNA concentrations for serum and non-preservation tubes. In contrast, the messenger RNA concentration is extremely low in RNA streck, so that's the bottom uh, second from the right, and increases over time in all four for other preservation tubes, which is clearly problematic. So instead of preser preserving, they're increasing the RNA content in the liquid biopsy, which is definitely not what you want. Um, we turned all that information into a new performance metric. Because of sake of time, I will not discuss how, how it's calculated and what it means. Uh, please have a look at our preprint. But I just want to end with this slide, is that um, uh, to, that summarizes the blood collection tube results. We finally selected four different, excuse me, five different performance metrics and visualized the average change over time. We believe that precision, biotype distribution, gene detection count, hemolysis, and messenger RNA concentration are important metrics that should not change over time. And it's clear that serum and the non-preservation tubes on the left have clearly much less changes over time compared to the so-called preservation tubes depicted on the right. So quickly prepared serum or EDTA citrate plasma within four hours is our current recommendation for messenger RNA studies. So we invite manufacturers to make better blood collection tubes that truly stabilize extracellular RNA for several days. With that, I want to conclude my talk, uh, summarize that we developed and benchmarked lab methods for extracellular RNA analysis. All human biofluids contain RNA likely reflecting health and specific disease states so we provide a roadmap for future biomarker research spike and normalization is key uh, and normalization may help a better understanding of complexity in biofluids and finally as always optimization standardization remains keys to success so don't jump don't be too enthusiastic and jump into the lab to do experiments think control validate and then do your work leaves me to thank my colleagues at Bayexel, Ghent University and Illumina. They're mentioned here and their contributions to the papers uh, have been mentioned along the way. Happy to take questions now or during to the round table and give the work back to the moderator. Thank you.